Okay, everyone, welcome. Uh, very thankful to have you join us here this evening. My name is Dan. I am the Director of Development Programming for the Bedford Playhouse. I want to welcome you to uh, what I'm sure will be yet another fascinating conversation uh, as part of our ongoing series um, and discussions with filmmakers. Um, before we start and before we introduce uh, AJ, I want to just remind everybody to please feel free to ask questions at any time. You can do so um, with the Q&A button that is at the bottom of your screen, um, it's at the top of your screen on your iPads or iPhones. Um, please refrain from using the chat feature if you can. It's okay if you do, but we prefer to go through the Q&A. It just makes things a little bit easier for us to follow. Um, I hope everyone was able to um, watch the film. Um, and we're going to talk in a little bit about uh, about that. Uh, but I want to also remind everybody to please consider um, if you appreciate this type of programming. Uh, Bedford Playhouse uh, is a nonprofit. Um, we welcome any contributions. Um, AJ, I'm sure will share uh, some information about how to donate uh, for the cause uh, to find a cure for uh, Rett syndrome. So please consider doing that as well. Um, we really, really appreciate all of your support. Uh, we can't do it without you. Uh, the community really is the backbone of everything that we do. Um, so let me quickly introduce uh, AJ. Uh, AJ Tesler is an award-winning television film and new media producer and director. He's created thousands of hours of content for the likes of Netflix, Comedy Central, Lionsgate, MTV, and Sony. His narrative feature directing debut, which is called Hero Mode, is due out this year. Uh, and I would like to welcome AJ to the to the uh, forum. There he is. All right, he's on the live, road, live from my car. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you to uh, everybody who has watched the movie and. Um, are people going to watch the movie now or people have already watched the movie? Well, hopefully they have watched the movie, but uh, if not, they will be doing so shortly. <laughs> Got it. And we're going to do Q and sorry, are we going to do Q&A now or are we going to give people a little bit? A little bit. We're going to do, uh, people can ask questions. I have, I have a bunch of questions for you and but people should ask, feel free to throw them out there for AJ if you watch the film. Right. Uh, if you want to learn more, um, there's a whole bunch of topics we can cover. Right. Well, I, I mean, our dream when we made this movie was so that we could share it with people and in hopes that it would have some impact in hopes that if you ever ran across somebody with Rett syndrome or with really any complex disorder, you would have a greater understanding for what that person is going through. Um, understand that that person may be locked inside their body and unable to do the things that you would hope that they would be able to do and also understand the impacts that it would have on, uh, on that person's parents family around them um, and so I'm, I'm excited to hear your questions and please I am if the movie didn't make it clear I'm a completely open book and there are no questions that will offend me there are no questions that I won't answer um, so please feel free to ask me anything that sparked your fancy or curiosity through watching the movie. that's great well let's uh let's start off with actually probably a. Uh, um... Uh, I'm sure one that uh, is on a couple of people's minds is, um, uh, especially for those of everyone who has watched the film, is what's what's the current status, especially in this COVID world? Um, how have you guys been managing? Uh, I mean, I'm sure things were challenging enough beforehand. Uh, how did how did COVID affect uh, how you guys were going about your daily lives? Um, well, um, it uh, it dramatically changed our entire life. We were very very nervous about what covid might do to maggie she already had respiratory issues um was already struggling to breathe on a daily basis um as we looked at how hospitals were starting to triage care uh, we were just afraid that because of maggie's disability that she wouldn't be a priority for care and so it was very important that we avoid it and so we um packed up our house in Los Angeles. We got into an RV and we left Los Angeles in August and we traveled around the country, making sure to avoid people everywhere at, at all costs. So we were staying off grid in uh, forests or on the back acre of a farm in, in Oregon or uh, wherever it was, just keeping our distance from people. 
Uh, we've also documented that. It's on our YouTube channel at uh, Magnolia's Hope. Right now I'm in my car because my family is at a campground outside of Dallas um, in a place where there is no cell service. So I had to drive frantically so that I could find uh, enough service to be here for all of you guys. And uh, um, she, she's, she's 10 years old now, correct? She is 10. The movie we finished, uh, the, the last shot of her in uh, the soccer uh the soccer goes at the end of the movie. I think she was nine, but other than that, she's uh, basically six to eight is when most of the filming was taking place. So um, one question that uh, we actually had submitted via email prior to this um, is, is sort of, I guess, more of a technical question. Um, given that you were, you know, what, what were the challenges? You, you were really filming your day-to-day -day life and activities. So did you ever have a moment where you felt that it was, you um, I don't know if the word intrusive is the right word or that you just felt like not today. I, I don't feel like doing this today. Uh, you ever, did you ever have those moments and, and how, um, how did you like figure out what was really what, did, I mean, how much did you actually shoot that you didn't use? You must have hours and hours and hours and hours of unused footage. Yeah. What, one of my favorite stories is just when I, when I first started talking to our editor, Scott Shepard, um, who um, had done a couple of these kinds of docs. So he was asking what kind of footage we had. And I said, I don't know, I think it's probably like eight to 10 hours of footage, not really doing the math in my head of how much we could have. And he said, okay, well, you can probably get like 10 to 15 minutes out of that. And then um, I said, I think we can probably stretch a full length feature out of it. And I dropped off all the footage. And a couple of days later, he called and said, AJ, there's 150 hours of footage here. Uh, so I think you're probably right. We have a full feature. Um, so there was a lot of footage, you know, I think that like any parent, I was just filming our day-to-day -day life. Um, and a lot of it, we were filming for doctors. They're, hey, this is happening. Um, can you take a look at this? And a lot of the therapies we were filming because some of our therapists were in local. So we were filming and then sending the videos to them for them to review what we were actually doing. Um, and there were certainly times when we didn't want to film. And there were times when Maggie let us know that she didn't want to film. In fact, a lot of the reasons why there were, uh, there were a lot of YouTube videos early on and not so many later on is that Maggie just kind of decided that she made it clear that it wasn't something she really wanted to be doing. Um, and it kind of dovetailed with the same time with when she started experiencing seizures and really had a, had a tough time for a couple of years. Um, and so that made sense. And now she's a little bit more, uh, more amenable to, to filming um, and has, has opened up a, a little bit more. And I think she especially likes to, sh to show you know, the, the positive angles of it more so than, than the negative as to it. So one of the things, I mean, uh, and, and I just also mentioned for everybody who just joined us, um, please feel free to ask questions using the Q&A forum. Um, I'm, I'm assuming everybody here has, um, has most everybody seen the film. Um, for those of you who haven't, we will share the link again, along with the recording of this conversation. But um, the thing, I mean, there were so many moments that are, are really powerful and, and effective. And I think, and, you know, certainly it's understood that the, the purpose, the motivation behind the film is to raise awareness, um, not just for your own situation, but for everybody who has, has this condition. Um, and the moment, I think it's very early on, you rattle off all the different therapies and, um, the, you know, occupational therapy and speech therapy and, uh, and all that. And you talk about um, how you, you and your wife really uh, stopped your lives to, to, to do this for her. Um, what did, what was happening behind, if you can talk about it, what was happening behind the scenes that you didn't show? Like, I mean, we saw a lot of the footage where she was where she was cooperating, where she wasn't cooperating. Um, I mean, how, can you give us a sense of really how many hours a day this was going? It was literally all day, I'm assuming. It was, it was, a lot, it was most of the waking hours we were focused on. Uh, we had split it up. So we, were, we also had a nanny, Shelly, who was with us. And we kind of all split it up and said, I'll be responsible for physical therapy. You were responsible for occupational therapy. And you'll be responsible for speech therapy. And then um, every minute of every day that we were with her, 
that's what we were doing with her. That's how we engaged with her. She couldn't use her hands, really. She wasn't playing with anything. So it also gave us things to do with her that were engaging and that we knew were helpful and were helping her learn how to be a, her, her better self. Um, and so she never really got into TV. There was never like a downtime for her. She was always just skipping around and, and running around. And so we wanted to really try to focus her energy and, and, and try to, to help her be, uh, help her as much as we possibly could. Um, and so that's, that's kind of how, uh, how we played with her. We just taught, treated all of that as, as play in the early days. And then when we added in vision therapy, that was an additional half hour every day. Um, she was going to, in the movie, I said she was going to the school where they were doing ABA therapy with her all day. So, um, you know, it really, it was, it was, it was pretty constant for most of her early development. Um, I'd say th once we found out about the diagnosis from like three to five, three to six, it was pretty constant. The vision therapy started really frustrating her towards the end of that. And so pulled back on that and then um, it started focusing on other stuff and then she started going to school and so we just didn't have that much time to actually work with her and once we would put her in school um, started kind of focusing more on her education that's when I started focusing more on, on getting back to work too so we, we ended up being able to pull back having to pull back a lot on that um, on, the, on the therapies at that point uh, most you actually, since you just mentioned it, we have a couple of questions um, about school. What what is her school like? What's what kind of um, what is like her school experience? Well, um, we have jumped around a little bit. So uh, her her preschool was a special needs school that we focused on autism and autism development because that was a lot of what we. Uh, what the diagnoses were early on was it might be something on the spectrum for you to attend to. And so in Los Angeles, there were schools that were really dedicated to that. And that's what she focused on in preschool. Then her, in the public school that we, that they were trying to send her to, she went, was a charter program. Uh, the school for typical kids was a very good school. Um, but we showed up on the first day and every other kid was attended to by a nurse and essentially catatonic. And that just was not what was appropriate for Maggie. So we pulled her out of that and we spent a couple of months trying to find the right school. The, the, this whole system has been very complicated to navigate. We ended up settling on a homeschool program called Kava, uh, which was all virtual. So we were already prepared for virtual schooling well before virtual schooling became what everybody was doing. Um, and uh, they had a community program where uh, twice a week they would have a classroom setting. And so she went with an aide to that setting and the rest of the time was home and that allowed her to do her school on her own timeline. Because um, it's, uh, while well, she is cognitively age appropriate in every way, it does take her a little bit longer to get those answers out because she can't just say yes or no, or she, you know, she might not be breathing at the time, so she can't give you those signals. Um, and then in third grade, we had enrolled her in a completely typical classroom. She was in a typical classroom with about six other kids, seven other kids, and it was a private school um, that was, uh, was that our son was going to for preschool and they were uh, very accepting of us and, and our family. And, and that was uh, the perfect setting for her and we loved it. Um, and she went there from October of 2019 until they closed schools in March of 2020. Um, and then we went back to just homeschooling her. Uh, we bought all of the books and uh, went on the road and figured we would teach her all the things we could on the road and she would gain life experiences and learn things that way. Um, and now we're excited to be enrolling her in a public school in Connecticut uh, this fall. Great. Um, so you talk, you mentioned it. Uh, so if I'm, am I correct? I think I've seen this and you mentioned it and it was on your website. It's often misdiagnosed as autism. Is that right? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that early on, uh, it's often misdiagnosed with autism. It used to actually, Rett syndrome used to be on the autism spectrum. They used to claim that it was uh, one of the most debilitating disorders for females on the autism spectrum. It is no longer on the autism spectrum, but I think that's mostly because it's got its own thing now, and autism spectrum is the spectrum of a variety of dis- different disorders that all kind of have the same phenotypes. So, 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 so can you clarify, um, just sort of like, what, what was the timeline from when, um, from when, you know, you, you started noticing that she needed, there was something, something going on to when she was officially diagnosed. And I know you talk about that date being seared into your memory. Like how, what was the timeline? How long did it take them to diagnose her? So, uh, she was born with a little bit of torticollis when she was, when, when she was born. And so at about three months, we were seeing a PT and that PT was working with her on and off over the next 12 months or so. And it was around the time that uh, we noticed that she had this hypotonia that she couldn't really stand up and she wasn't squatting properly uh, that she suggested we talk to some other specialists. And so that process from there was about 15 months until about two and a half. At two and a half, we met with a developmental pediatrician out in Los Angeles. And her first reaction was, this is definitely not autism. Um, there is, um, and then she ordered some blood tests, which we were hesitant to do because of men giving, getting maggoted to draw blood, which seemed like that was going to be complicated and difficult. It took us a little bit of time to do that. And then it took us about five months to get the results back. Um, they would trickle in a variety of different disorders that they had tested of, no, it's not this. No, it's not this. No, it's not this. And I think it came down to fragile X and Red syndrome were the two that we were waiting on. We heard it wasn't fragile X. And so then once I heard that it wasn't any of those, I was still hopeful that it wasn't Red syndrome either. And it was just kind of this this thing we would be able to combat with some aggressive therapies. Uh, and then on uh, December, uh, December 17th, 2013, um, we found out that it was indeed Red Syndrome. Um, we went to Disneyland the next day uh, just to get our heads out of that sad place. Um, and we rode It's a Small World, uh, which for somebody with a sensory processing issue it, during Christmas time is the worst place you can take them. And uh, Maggie immediately started screaming and trying to dive out of the boat. So that was, uh, was, uh, <laughs> that was our experience. All the way through. Well, I, 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 among many moments in the film, uh, another one that, that stays with you is, um, I believe it's a comment your wife makes um, when she talks about the diagnosis and that, the doctor said, don't Google it, yeah. um, which I think, what, what, what did you think about that particular piece of advice? Was that good advice or bad advice to not, not I mean, we had it? Or, we had already Googled it, so <laughs> <laughs> the advice was, uh, was ill-timed. Um, I mean, I think the advice is well-intended because the information on the internet is dated. It's based on what it gets the most clicks is what gets delivered to you first, and uh, the newest information doesn't get the most clicks. So, you know, some of some of the parents that we've met along the way have said that the doctors told them to take their daughter home and love them. There was nothing that they were ever going to be able to do for them. And, you know, that's changed dramatically. I think that parents who are getting diagnosed with, red, with kids who get diagnosed with breast syndrome now, they're saying there's a lot of really promising science. There's nothing yet, but there should be soon. So, focus on the therapies now and hopefully there will be a treatment or something um, something beyond that um, well within your daughter's lifetime. And I think that that's extremely promising and it's a testament to all of the hard work that all of the parents and, uh, and researchers and clinicians and scientists have done before we got, we even knew about Red Syndrome. Uh, so that's actually a question that's been submitted um, sort of goes to that, but you, you sort of already answered it, I guess, sort of as the status, the current status of a treatment. Um, so there is no, there is no real treatment, but there are therapies. So like, what are some of the therapies that have been developed? It just, I mean, perhaps even since the film was completed between then and now. 
Well, the therapies are still the same. They're still physical therapy, occupational therapy, aquatherapy, hippotherapy, all those same therapies. They because you really treat it as a rehabilitation because they knew how to do these things and they lost it. So much like a stroke victim, um, you have to they have to relearn pathways in their brains. But as I say in the in, in the animation, that sometimes there are too many pathways. So how they communicate with the rest of their body gets complicated. Sometimes there are too few. And you can't just generate new ones. Now there are promising treatments and uh, gene therapies that are that are coming along uh, shortly. We hope uh, it's been a number of years that we thought that they were coming along shortly, and uh, they aren't there yet. So there's currently a small molecule molecule treatment in uh, a phase three clinical study called trophenotide, um, which we all are hopeful we'll get to market sometime in, in the beginning of next year. Uh, we're all waiting on the results of that clinical, of that uh, third trial. Um, there are gene therapies from health companies like Novartis and Tasha uh, that are both exploring uh, clinical phase one clinical trials, hopefully to start sometime in 2022 as well. Um, and those in theory would be transformative, um, but uh, until we try them in people, we don't know. Um, but uh, they all attack the root cause of Rett syndrome, so it's really promising. Uh, and the research has been very promising as well. Uh, another question that came in um, was, I guess this is something uh, uh, a little bit of what we talked about before, but um, uh, between between caring for her and the making of the film, how do you how do you maintain any sort of semblance of privacy? I mean, you've given up your privacy to raise awareness for this, um, and I guess in a now with you guys trekking across America, it's a little easier. Uh, but how do you how do you maintain your 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 privacy, uh, or does it matter at this point? Um, I, I don't I don't know. You know, I think that we've we've taken it upon ourselves to make teaching people about Rett syndrome paramount because it's this just awful thing that we don't want to we don't want to be a part of anymore and we don't want anybody to be a part of and the only way we see of getting out of that is by spreading awareness by raising money uh, by funding research as much as we possibly can as quickly as we possibly and so if in the short term, we lose some privacy from that, um, I think the, the end justifies the means and, and it, it's ultimately a net benefit for Maggie. And that's why we're all, why we're all doing it. You know, if, if I was just showing her off or, or showing this movie for the sake of empathy or, or pity, I, I, I wouldn't feel right about it. But, you know, I think that the goal here is to impact the future of all kids with Rett syndrome and to impact the relationships that all kids with complex disorders might be able to build with people who can walk away from this movie with a better understanding of, of what that must be like, then, um, you know, I think it all, it, 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 it all makes it much more worth it if, in that frame. Sure. Uh, this is a question that's been submitted uh, by, by Jenna, who is the parent of Madden, who is a six-year-old boy with rats. Um, do you feel that when you are discussing this with other organizations or in your, your travels, um, you're hearing more of about boys who are being diagnosed? Yeah, that conversation's changed a lot since we, since Maggie was diagnosed. When Maggie was diagnosed, it was very much a female disorder. And I think since then, um, my wife has been very, uh, very proactive in that, in that discussion too, of really changing just the way we frame that because there are boys with Brett syndrome and, and they, uh, they struggle just the same way that, that our girls with Rett syndrome do. And the hope is that the treatments are just the same and all of that. And, and it's been, I can only imagine how hard and how lonely it's felt for, for, for families like Jenna's to get a diagnosis of Rett syndrome 
and then still not feel included in a community of people who are saying, hey, you have a boy that's different. And, um, and so I think that we've been, we've been happy to see and, and we've made a point of it in our movie to say mostly happens to girls and sometimes happens to boys um, because we do want to help reframe that conversation too. Um, so our, and we know, uh, I know at least four boys uh, with Rett syndrome right now. And, um, you know, I think that, I think that it's important for, for, for all families dealing with the same kind of diagnosis to, to feel like a part of the, the same community. Yeah, and, and Jenna just added a comment that uh, appear, it, apparently boys are still not included in clinical trials to this day, which uh, is a little surprising. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there, there's almost certainly extra risk because with with a lot of the treatments that with girls, it's X-linked and it's focused on the inactive X chromosome. Um, and since boys don't have an inactive X chromosome to switch that out, there, there may be some complications there. But uh, hopefully that'll change as, as we get through these clinical trials and really see you know, what, what can, how, how things can be helpful. I'm sorry you're going through that too. All right, yeah, keep those questions coming, folks. This is uh, really great. Um, this is somewhat of a lengthy, it's really more of a comment than a question, but I'm going to read it in its entirety because I think it's important. Um, and uh, and it, it reflects on the, the impact of the film. Um, so this is a comment from Lisa. Uh, and Lisa says that as the first cousin of someone who had Rett syndrome, uh, she was deeply touched by the courage of the film there were a couple of junctures where she had to pause and became emotional remembering her cousin, her aunt, her uncle, and the care, the unending care that went into helping her live the best life she could. She passed away about a year and a half ago at 51. Being born in the late 60s, she was not actually diagnosed until her teens. And the years of, years of not knowing what was going on were emotionally exhausting. And Lisa's comment is that she is in awe of the strength and perseverance each member of your family exhibits in the same way. She was in awe of her aunt and uncle and cousin. The ups and downs and multitude of unknowns are unfathomable to the average individual. And thank you for this film and your passion to raise the awareness and the support for ongoing research. So um, I, I think that's a great comment and it certainly reflects very well on the film, which I think everyone will agree was, was really great. Um, so kudos to you that you deserve, you deserve that one. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you, Lisa. I'm sorry about your loss. Um, and, you know, I think that a lot of what we're able to do now is because of Lisa's parents and because of Lisa and, and her contributions to all of us knowing more about Red Syndrome and what it is today. How do you find, um, this is actually another question that touches on that subject. How, how, how do you find the challenges of raising money and awareness of a condition that is relatively so rare? Uh, I mean, it's, it's one thing when people are raising money for diabetes or for cancer research, um, but at, at the numbers that you provide in the film relative to the, to the world population, this is a very, very rare condition. So, so how, do you, how do you make it forefront? Like what are, what are the, some of the strategies you guys have employed? I mean, the film is a great way of doing that, but what else can be done to raise the awareness of it? Um, well, I mean, I think media always helps and I, I work in media, so that, that'll continue to be a focus of how we continue to do it. I think that one of the, one of the, the things I always say at fundraisers is like, you can throw money into, a, into an AIDS research or cancer research, all very valuable, all very valid causes. We all have somebody who's been touched by, by, some, of these, by some of these things. Um, we really are very close to a cure for red state. Uh, the science would agree that if some of these gene therapies work, that we would have reversed the root cause of Rett syndrome. And to me, being involved, seeing your money actually have that kind of real impact is really what philanthropy is all about. It's yeah, it's you're going to support the things that matter most to you because somebody in your life is touched with a certain thing. But it's also about using the, the money to, to have a real impact. And I think that with Red Syndrome, donating to 
to the research, it really has a chance to to have an impact on not just my daughter's life, 350,000 other people around the world. And because it's not degenerative, because it's a progressive disorder, they believe that with a treatment that works, that it, like I said in the movie, she just wouldn't have Rett syndrome anymore. That she'd be able to regain all of the things that she's lost much easier than all of the rehab we've been trying to do while she still has Rett syndrome, while she still has all those neural difficulties. And so I have think you, that that's a, that's a compelling, it's a compelling concept for, for people to think about when they, when they think about what causes to, uh, to support. Have you been, uh, have you continued to shoot footage and document uh, what's been happening since, since the film ended, that's where we left off? In yeah, the we, we've got Magnolia's Hope 2, Electric Boogaloo, um, we're working on now. Uh, yeah, we, we have, and, and we've documented this entire series, this entire um, adventure uh, as we've traveled the country. So we've been, you mentioned, releasing that as a series on our YouTube channel at Magnolia's Hope. Um, and so it's youtube.com slash Magnolia's Hope. We also will probably turn that into a feature um, that uh, maybe we'll end up releasing sometime, sometime next year. And we should remind everyone um, that your website has not only um, information on how to donate to Rhett's research, um, but a lot of other information that folks hopefully will find informative and useful. So it's magnoliashope.com, right? No, no yep. possibly. Right. So everybody, yep. please, um, if you if you haven't yet, um, check out that website. Uh, there's a lot of really, really great information on it. Um, I guess, AJ, um, the one other question, the last question that I've, I have that's been submitted so far um, is it, it was so uplifting, um, I, I guess, towards the end when you talk about, um, you know, giving her uh, as happy a life as she can have and the, the scenes with the skiing and the soccer and all of the, the skateboarding and all of that. So how do you... Um, I guess the, the question, the way the question is framed is what are her social interactions like, uh, which we've seen in the film. Um, but beyond that, how, how, what else has she gotten into, I guess, beyond she likes the extreme sports. Clearly. She does like the extreme sports. Um, yeah. Social interactions are really complicated. Um, friends are very hard. We uh, try to foster relationships with typical kids and with the, the kids of our, typical, of our, the typical kids of our friends. And it's really hard. Um, because she doesn't talk and she doesn't engage in the same way. You can't just say, come on, let's do this. And then she'll do it. It's, uh, so that part has been really frustrating for, for her and for us, uh, to find people who can engage with her socially appropriately. Um, so that part's hard. Um, now we've, uh, we've just started teaching her how to how to paint with her eyes. She's really enjoying that. She really enjoys kind of game night with the family. And uh, especially during this year, it's been it's been sledding, it's been skateboarding, it's been uh, anything we can do as our own family unit without engaging in larger crowds. Uh, but she will be very excited to go to another Taylor Swift concert when those are allowed to happen. Uh, so uh, just one other, I guess, sort of a comment slash question was during the course of the film, um, we obviously see because you show it to us, um, the, the other changes that go into your life, you had a son um, and, and other things that happened. So all obviously over the course of that time, um, she clearly adapted. Uh, it looks like she adapted to having a younger brother. Um, was there any concern about not not that he would necessarily have frets, but because uh, it's so rare, but was there any concern about how she would respond? To having a younger sibling? Um, you know, they have been extraordinarily typical in their relationship. I don't think that we were concerned of how she would interact with him. I think we were, we were concerned, obviously, that there, not that he would have Rhett's, but not that he would have Rhett, but just because we had already lived through a, a period of uncertainty and a diagnosis of, of a severe disorder, 
Um, we knew that we weren't guaranteed a healthy child. And so there was trepidation throughout his early years just to every single thing we made sure we checked and made sure it was nothing so that uh, we could alleviate any of those concerns. And the two of them have developed a very typical, um, very good relationship. They, they love each other. Uh, they both laugh at each other when the other one's in trouble. They both cry when the other one's crying. Uh, it's, uh, it helps her. Uh, he helps move her hands to, to pick up things the same way that we do. And he helps, um, he helps communicate with her computer, really anything that, that he can do. And he doesn't think about it as helping. He's just communicating and, and engaging with his sister. And, um, you know, I wish things weren't so hard on, on him to have to do that either. But, uh, but I'm, I'm very happy that he, that she has him and that, that we have him to, uh, to really think out all of great well um before we uh i, I want to just uh, ask if anybody has any other questions uh please feel free to post them and while we're doing that um i want to just also mention real quick that um uh as i said at the top we we have been recording this so uh everybody who registered will get a link to this recording um we will link to aj's site um any other aj if there's any other resources you'd like us to include just let us know we're happy to share them uh, for everybody here. And if there are no other questions, I want to really thank AJ for an incredible film. I mean, it was really very, very compelling. Certainly it's a, it's a heartbreaking situation, but I am sure that with the awareness that you're building, uh, that as you said, that the a treatment will come relatively soon. I think that, you know, we, we're, we're believers in science and, uh, and it was, it was, it was so compelling. I had, I would recommend everybody watch it again because I, I watched it twice uh, and I thought it was it was even better the second time through. Um, so thank you, AJ, for taking the time from your road trip. Uh, <laughs> coming to thank you, Dan. Thank you me. very much for, for putting this together. I'm so grateful for you uh, sharing this story and allowing me to come and answer questions. And I really appreciate it very much. Great. And uh, we really appreciate your time. And uh, to all of you, thank you. Please check out our website, uh, bedforplayhouse.org. Um, we are reopening uh, in a few weeks, and we will hopefully see most of you there. Um, thank you for taking the time to join us tonight. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thanks again, AJ. We hope to see you again soon.